Uh, yes, yeah, so long before lunch, I decided to do something quantum merit, and this one has obviously it's obviously touched a raw nerve because uh, I'm looking at sort of pandemic levels of registrations. I mean, it shot to a hundred and more pretty quickly, and people were still registering uh, this morning, which is great. So there's obviously a lot of interest in this, and uh, you may be um, may have read this one, the you know Virgo principles of the law of restitution, still a price tag on there of ninety five quid which makes my book on contractual indemnities uh, look an absolute steal. And you've probably read um, Burroughs here on the uh, law of restitution. And you're going to say to me, I've read those cover to cover, Richard, you know, tell me something I don't know. Uh, well, I am going to tell you something you don't know, because um, the cases I'm going to be talking about today are very recent. Um, and those books are actually a little bit uh, long in the tooth now. So I'm going to look at uh, the route to the loot. If you do work for someone, uh, what do you get paid? There's no contract. Uh, normally I talk about the law of contract, but now we admit there's no contract, but you've done stuff for people. So how do you get paid? What are the legal principles on which you can get paid and how much do you get paid? So uh, without further ado, uh, now everyone is, is here. Uh, let me uh, share my screen with you and talk you through a few of the cases. There we go. So, um, uh, so you should see uh, quantum merit. We're talking about quantum merit. Uh, it's not a new uh, issue, of course. Um, as Chief Baron Pollock said, right back in the 1850s, one cleans another's shoes. What can the other do but wear them? Um, and that's uh, recognizing one of the fundamental problems in the law of unjust enrichment, as we now call it. If you do work for someone, well, they're going to have to use it. So that's just the nature of the beast. If you've done something for someone, they have to use it. So simply using it isn't necessarily a means of saying, well, you've used it, so you've got to pay for it. Since the 1850s, of course, the academics have moved in into this, this area. And it's, it's a huge and burgeoning area of the law, and it's got its own uh, vocabulary with it. So judges and academics talk about concepts like uh, incontrovertible benefit, subjective devaluation, free acceptance. These are some of the key uh, elements of a claim for unjust enrichment. What do they mean? Well, uh, take an example. Um, uh, I, in my law before lunch uh, months ago, and I said I was going off to uh, the Oriental in Bangkok, and uh, well, going back a couple of decades, we were there. Uh, and my wife took with us some deck shoes and uh, she was very proud of them. She'd had them for years and they were, as she put it, uh, fashionably shabby. Um, and uh, we, we went out for dinner on the first night and the room butler, and because you get that in uh, that, that sort of hotel, went into our wardrobe whilst we were having dinner and, and polished every pair of shoes he could find. And when we, we got back, my wife was furious because there were her fashionably shabby deck shoes. Uh, and they were uh, beaming like a, a new penny. Well, uh, they were clean and they'd been waxed and everything, they looked absolutely perfect. So there's an incontrovertible benefit, but my wife had never freely accepted it. Free acceptance in the sense that uh, she was free to decline as well as accept. And also, of course, there was an element of subjective devaluation. She didn't want them cleaned. She, she, never, she wouldn't have paid for that because she wanted them to carry on being shabby and comfortable. So that's an illustration of those three concepts. Let's take a look at some very recent uh, case law. First one is this, um, Kinled Investments uh, against Zopar Group. Uh, Kinled was a private wealth management advisory business, Zopar, you've probably heard of them, a big financial services company. At that time, uh, Zopar wanted to set up a, a retail banking business. And look, they had to go through a, a lot of regulatory hurdles. Uh, in particular, they had to uh, go through two investment stages. Kinled was retained uh, to find those investors who would invest stonking wadges of cash. And they were going to be paid uh, a commission or 3% of the investment sums they found and introduced. Well, they introduced a company called Silverstripe and they went in for 10 million pounds on the first investment round and 140 million pounds in the second investment round. But the contract that Kinled had with Zopa only lasted three months. Now the lawyers were clever enough to realize that you might make an introduction on the very last day of the three months of the contract, 
but the investment money might come in much later, which is why they had this 12 month tail period, as they called it. So if the, if the introduction was made within the three months, and then the investment money was made at any time in the following 12 month tail period, then it still counted for getting money. So the 10 million first investment um, was payable and absolutely everybody agreed on that. But the second investment round fell outside the 12 month tail period. Pinled said um, they had to have a, a payment on a quantum merit basis because they had continued doing work um, helping uh, Zopar uh, find money and uh, engineer the uh, second investment uh, made by Silver Stripe. So they said there had to be a quantum merit for that second investment uh, made, even though everybody agreed it was made outside the 12 month tail period. The judge, as is so often in these cases, um, the judge looked at a vast amount of uh, case law and a vast amount of academic literature. I'm going to sort of pause at this point because I'm going to talk about one of the cases which I think sets out the principles very, very nicely. It's another case in the financial services sector. Morgate Capital against HIG European Capital. Now, in that case, one uh, Mr. Mockett of Morgate had kept close to his contacts in HIG. HIG um, was uh, 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 trying to uh, find uh, acquisition uh, targets. Um, and they um, uh, were using, uh, were talking with uh, Mr. Mockett of Morgate. Um, now, depending on which evidence you believed, either Morgate provided valuable strategic advice, uh, helping them to find a target, namely a company called uh, Bezier, uh, and helping them uh, acquire that target, or uh, if you believed uh, HIG, he was peripherally involved to begin with, but after Deloitte's were formally uh, appointed, um, Deloitte's got on with doing the rest, and uh, they did that with the help of external lawyers. His primary argument was there was, was that there was some sort of uh, oral agreement, but the judge made short shrift of that. So the secondary claim was one in quantum merit. The judge looked, as I said, at a vast number of authorities in this area, and he came up with the following principles, which are very relevant to, to the case I started considering. Um, the question of whether the law should impose an obligation uh, to pay is a question of justice, and you have to point to some unjust factor which, may, which cries out uh, for the court to order a payment to be made. Showing your capabilities or skills in a pre-contractual situation is not normally going to be chargeable. And the judge gave the example of where a solicitor attended a beauty parade and would be expected to read into a matter and give uh, preliminary opinions or a high level view of, of, of strategy or, or whatever. And he said everybody uh, would agree that that is not a chargeable um, situation. Uh, uh, if you're a solicitor, you probably think it's chargeable. Um, if you don't win the beauty parade, but uh, that's a different question. But the court will impose an obligation to pay where the defendant has received some sort of incontrovertible benefit as a result of the claimant's services. And that can in particular happen if the defendant has specifically requested the claimant to provide services or accepted them freely in the sense of having the ability uh, to refuse them when they were offered. However, the court won't impose an obligation to pay where the evidence is simply that the claimant took the risk that he was going to be doing all this work and simply might not get paid because that wasn't a contract. In the case of Morgate, the judge simply said, well, the claimant took the risk. They were there. They were providing little bits of advice and help and talking with HIG, but they knew there wasn't a contract. And the judge said, these are big boys and girls. These are very mature city people operating in the city. They know what a contract is. They could have had a contract, but they chose not to. And those uh, quotes I've put there uh, from the judge in the Moorgate case uh, show the difficulty, in fact, of uh, getting a payment on a quantum merit. It's not the role of the law of unjust enrichment to create for the parties contracts that they never made. Neither the British Steel Corporation case nor other authority establishes a general right to payment for requested services in the absence of a contract. In other words, if you're going for a quantum merit in the absence of a contract, you're starting on the back foot 
And you've got to point to some, some factor of injustice which cries out for the court to correct that injustice by ordering a payment. So going back to the uh, Kinled and Zopa case, uh, the judge applied those principles as outlined in uh, the Moorgate case I've just looked at uh, and said uh, Kinled uh, was entitled uh, to nothing. He noted in particular uh, that the parties had drafted a, a detailed contract that provided for this 12 month tail period. So they must have envisaged that something might happen after the 12 months was up uh, and therefore would fall simply outside the contractual terms. Zopar never gave uh, Kinled any assurances about a second contract. In fact, uh, Kinled had sent a, a draft contract to cover the second investment round to Zopar on Zef several occasions, but Zopar had never signed it and they'd never returned it and they never gave Kinled any reason to believe that they were uh, interested in a contract for the second investment round. In other words, Kinled's services were provided entirely speculatively. There was no reason uh, for Zopar to assume that uh, Kinled would expect to be paid without a finalized contract covering that second uh, investment round. What comes out of these cases is the fact that if you're doing free work, you are taking a risk. It's sometimes called working at risk. And the risk is you simply won't get paid at all unless you can point to some monumental injustice which screams out to the court uh, to make an order uh, to uh, make a payment to correct that injustice. The second uh, and very recent case is this one, Gray against Smith and Blackmore. Uh, Smith was the driving force and founder of Blackmore. Gray was a US investment professional living in London. They had known each other at college some 20 years previously. They weren't close friends or anything like that, but they met uh, socially, uh, as I set out there on the slide. And they had a couple of chats about uh, the Blackmore business uh, and Smith had left his uh, secure job in the city. He had established Blackmore. The idea was that he would find investment uh, uh, people with money. Uh, he would invest uh, that money for them and, of course, earn money off the back of that. What Gray said was coming out of those two meetings, there was an oral agreement to work together, that they would pool contacts, they would undertake joint marketing, they would together as assemble a team of investment professionals, they would manage the capital that they raised. Well, what actually happened was this, they actually worked together very closely for 14 months. Gray received a Blackmore email address. At one point, he even became a director of Blackmore. He did provide his personal contacts and they did undertake joint marketing activities. In fact, they went to the States uh, for an extended uh, time and together they tried to work Gray's personal contacts there to get money. But after 14 months, they'd managed to raise big fat zero, absolutely no money at all. And Smith uh, told Gray that he was then taking Blackmore in a different direction and didn't need uh, Gray's services any longer. So they worked together 14 months, email address, director of the company, pooling contacts, joint activities. Was Gray entitled to a quantum merit in the absence of an oral contract? The judge again made short shrift to the oral uh, contract uh, argument. But was there an entitlement to a quantum merit. And the judge uh, again said, no, there wasn't. Again, a, 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 a monumental analysis of the case law and academic literature in this area. And one of the cases, again, that gets cited is, is the countrywide communications case against ICL Pathway, which I haven't got time to look at uh, today. But another one is, is the, uh, I think it's House of Lords at that stage, or, or it may have been Supreme Court, uh, in the, of Benedetti and Sawaris. And they said, if you've got a claim for a quantum merit for unjust enrichment, as we now call it, you have to ask yourself four questions. Has the defendant been enriched? Was the enrichment at the claimant's expense? Was the enrichment unjust? And are there, finally, any defences available to the defendant? Well, in this particular case, uh, the judge said it fails at the first principle. The defendant simply hasn't been enriched. The aim of working together was to find investment capital, and they'd found precisely none. 
uh, there was no investment capital at all. So seen in that way, there was no enrichment. The other thing is this, say there had been an enrichment, what would Gray have been entitled to? Well, Gray's evidence was that he'd spent 2,235 hours over 14 months. He applied an hourly rate of 750 euros to that, coming up with a claim of 1.6 million. As the judge said, um, that's a lot of money. Uh, he compared that with the earnings of uh, Mr. Smith, who'd set up the company Blackmore, who paid himself uh, the relatively modest sum. I think it was about 80,000 pounds a year or something. I, I mean, I appreciate it's, it's well above the national average wage, but it's chicken feed compared to what people are earning uh, in the city. Uh, and he said it doesn't make sense to pay someone on a quantum merit 1.6 million whilst the founder of the company was only taking 80,000 pounds out of the business. It doesn't make sense. And he said, look, if you're going to value uh, uh, an enrichment, even if you go about it, the value is an objective test. What would a reasonable person in the defendant's position have had to pay for the services? And that uh, could be an hourly rate. As a solicitor, I would typically think of applying my hourly rate to work that I had done. Um, but that's not necessarily true. In the city, people very often work on a commission basis, a percentage of the investment funds raised, or it could be a flat fee, or it could be some sort of ongoing royalty. In this particular case, the judge said if he had found that there had been an enrichment, uh, he would have said it's not to be assessed by reference to an hourly rate. It would have been a commission, uh, a small percentage of the actual capital raised. And in any case, therefore, as they raised uh, zero capital, um, any percentage of zero is still uh, zero. So uh, several cases there, uh, work had been done, work could be done over a long period, but there was no entitlement to money uh, at all. So what can we make of all of this? Well, if you're the claimant, um, don't do work for free uh, without finalizing the contract. And the answer is that you really need to uh, close the deal uh, sooner uh, rather than later. You can carry on working for someone, as Mr. Gray found. Uh, you can carry on working for month after month after month. But it could well be that unless there is some unjust factor there, the court is probably going to say you were working at risk, as it's put. And the risk was yours. You took the risk of no contract eventuating. What about if you're on the receiving end of free services? I mentioned unconscionability. What if the defendant behaves unconscionably? Go back to that Zopar case and Kinled and Zopar. Remember that 12-month uh, tail period? What if on the final day of the 12-month tail period, Zopar had received an offer of investment and they had said, uh, don't make the offer today, make it in a week's time knowing that they would then fall outside of the 12 month tail period uh, and they would therefore technically be outside the contract. Now at that stage you're introducing some sort of unconscionability into it and that's the sort of area where a court might say, not necessarily would, but they might say that was unconscionable behaviour on the part of uh, the defendant and that might bring it within the scope of a claim for unjust enrichment. You need to avoid giving assurances or making specific requests uh, for work. It doesn't have to be a, an offer or a representation or an estoppel in the way that uh, lawyers understand these things. Many of the, the cases you look at in this area, the work is done um, in, in a social setting, over a coffee, a lunch, a dinner or whatever, or just casually uh, in, in conversations or over email or whatever. But avoid making assurances, avoid assuring someone that they will get a contract. Don't make specific requests for work. Uh, if you make a specific request for a piece of work, even in the absence of a contract, again, as in the countrywide case, the court might well find uh, a claim justified uh, for unjust enrichment. Don't go along um, with the situation. Don't actively accept freely proffered goodies. I'm just looking um, at the, the delegate list there. So if I um, come along to one of you and offer you free legal services, uh, my advice to you is uh, don't touch it with a barge pole, run a mile, uh, because uh, if you're doing that, if you accept free legal services, the more it looks like you know what's being 
done and you know it's being done freely, the more you accept it, the more you use it, having the chance to refuse it, uh, the more you accept it, uh, again, it starts to look like an unjust factor. And the court might say, uh, this is an un unjust enough uh, for us to order a payment to be made. And again, finally, uh, as in the, the Kinled case, uh, watch out for those draft contracts coming in. Uh, don't return them signed. Um, do remember the value of saying subject to contract. If you get a draft contract, uh, don't just sit on it. It's a good idea to ping back an email saying whatever the reality of the situation is, this needs to go to my external lawyers for review. It needs a board, main board uh, review and sign off. Um, it's subject to contract. Or simply, I don't think there's a contract and I don't want to sign this contract. It might bring the free services to an end, but it's better to know that situation. So interesting cases. Um, if you like uh, what I do, you can uh, buy me a coffee. You don't have to. Um, it, it's uh, uh, entirely up to you. It takes longer to put together a short talk than it does a long one. Um, if you have any questions, happy to take them uh, now. Uh, stop sharing. So if any questions, happy to do that. Um, other than that, I will let you go off and have your uh, lunch, breakfast, uh, dinner, whatever it is. It's an interesting area. I remember talking to um, a lawyer uh, uh, years ago and, uh, uh, and he was saying to me, um, actually he was trying to say to me that having uh, no contract and doing work for free was actually better because you would always uh, be uh, awarded by a court your hourly rate. And he said, and if you were going into the contract uh, on a discounted basis, it's actually better to have a claim for quantum merit. Um, and as we've seen, that just isn't true at all. Um, no, there's, there's not an aspect of that that is uh, uh, correct. Uh, it's always working at risk. And you start out with a claim for quantum merit really on the back foot. And you've got to point to some pretty unjust fact. It has to be pretty unjust uh, for the courts to turn around and give you a claim for quantum merit. Any, um, any claims? By the way, this, this was in fact free. Uh, don't worry about that. There is no charge uh, for this. Um, so you would be getting an invoice for 20 minutes of my time each. But uh, um, any questions? No chat. Uh, yeah, I've got the Q&A open. I've got the, the chat open at the same time. What if you have a purchase order, even though there is uh, no contract? Well, if, if there's a purchase order, then um, uh, if someone's raised a purchase order on you, then uh, you're probably going to be working to the terms specified in that purchase order. So there would be a, a, a contract um, in place, I would have thought. Um, so yeah, so uh, uh, I think the purchase order would become the contract. <clears throat> Any other, any other questions before I close the session? It's amazing, as I say, it's, it's been interesting to, to get so many people uh, registering. It's actually uh, touched a raw nerve. Uh, I think a lot of people do free work absent a contract, mm -hmm. hoping the contract is going to eventuate, but you know, sometimes it just doesn't. Have you seen examples of rapid prototyping and proof of concepts in IT where these questions arise? The answer to that question is, is no, I haven't. Um, if you are doing uh, work like that, agile uh, development like that, it would normally be done under um, a, a contract. If you're, again, it goes back to what the courts actually say, if it's the equivalent of a beauty parade where the developer is trying to demonstrate its skills and capabilities, again, that falls out with the claim for unjust enrichment, unless you can point uh, to some unjust factor, uh, like a, a specific request to do uh, the development, some sort of assurance that there will be money forthcoming at the end of it, something like that. What if there is a contractual relationship, but the work done goes beyond what is covered by the contract? Well, that's, that's another um, instance where quantum merit may come in. And of course, we've seen uh, recently that um, if you've got a, a non clause there, a non variation clause there, and there is no formal written uh, amendment, um, again, the, the work, if it falls outside the contractual scope, um, might be done at risk. 
or it might be done uh, under quantum under, under quantum merit. But again, you'd have to be looking for those unjust factors. Um, if the work was done um, at a specific request by the recipient, that could be the uh, unjust factor that would encourage a, a court to award uh, a quantum merit payment to be made. But if it's simply work done uh, as uh, a freebie, as, as, a, as a favor, ex gratia, by the provider of services, uh, the court would likely turn around and say, well, you did that at risk. You can't foist work on the recipient. Go back to what Chief Baron Pollock said right back in the 1850s. Um, if you uh, polish someone else's shoes, what can that other do but put them on? Can the existence of an NDA around an overall early stage engagement affect the questions discussed today? Uh, well, in fact, in, in um, some of the cases, there is uh, an NDA, NDA, and I think in the Moorgate case, um, there were NDAs sloshing around, but it didn't mean to say that there was uh, a, an obligation to pay uh, for the work that was done, allegedly done by Moorgate Capital. So, uh, no, an NDA isn't direct evidence of an unjust factor, so as uh, inexorably to entitle you to a payment on a quantum merit basis is the answer to that. Any more, any more questions, any more, any more, any more? Give me a test. I mean, it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's an area of law. It's a bit like the law of contract in the 19th century as the, the judges came out of the old um, forms of action and uh, they had to develop a law of contract uh, fit um, for uh, the, the world's first industrialized uh, nation. And it was a great success. And it's something again that the judges have done with the law of unjust enrichment going back 50 years. So was, there were just a, a few disparate cases coming to some odd conclusions. And they sort of taken these cases and together with the support of academics, uh, they've come up with um, uh, uh, a, a coherent law. Uh, can you please repeat the four components of the test? Yes, you'll find that set out in Benedetti and Sawaris. Uh, and the four components are these. Has the defendant been enriched? Was the enrichment at the claimant's expense? Was the enrichment unjust? Are there any defences available to the defendant? Uh, defences, for example, might be this, this question of subjective devaluation which I mentioned earlier, think of my wife's shoes. Um, she didn't want to have her shoes cleaned and would not have paid for them to be cleaned anyway. It's subjective devaluation. So I hope that was uh, uh, a, a good illustration of, of one of the defences that's available. Uh, the countrywide communications case is, is a, a case which uh, again gets cited a lot in the case store. It's, it's worthwhile uh, taking a look at that as, everyone is still uh, online. And that's the case where the parties were working together in anticipation of a major government contract. And they were just, it was all pre-contractual uh, work. But at one point, uh, the defendant asked the claimant to do some work, some actual work uh, and produce a report on how the PR um, uh, aspects of the project and countrywide communications was, uh, bidding for the PR work. Uh, they asked them how they would roll out the PR work once the contract was achieved. And uh, the judge looked at the months and months and months of pre-contractual um, communications between the parties, but he latched onto that and said, aha, no, that wasn't at risk. That was a specific request for something that was very specific and it was of use uh, to, uh, to the defendant. And therefore, uh, Countrywide was, for that particular little bit of work, uh, entitled to a quantum merit uh, uh, award of money. So, um, any more, any more for any more, any more for any more. Otherwise, I'm going to close down shortly. I'm going to um, uh, pop this up on YouTube as well, and you'll, you'll get a link um, if you want to watch it again or, or share uh, with your colleagues, please feel free. Um, other than that, any more questions, any chat? Um, any more? I think people are beginning to leave. So I'm going to, if there's, if there's, just in case someone's typing still, I'm going to close it in a few seconds. 
Um, but there we go. I'm. Oh, thank you, thank you indeed, Kylie. All the best to you. I hope that was useful. Other than that, um, I am going to uh, shut the webinar down in five, four, three, two, one. So thanks to everyone. Hope that was useful. Speak soon.